Hi everyone, and welcome back to this series. Now, features are the building blocks of images. Today, we're going to explore how to detect, describe, and even match these features using OpenCV and TensorFlow. This is video 17 out of 20 in our beginner series and introduction to AI. Now, edges are sudden changes in a shape, and they can be crucial for understanding its structure. I've preloaded this text here, um, and I'd love for you guys to either follow along with your own Jupyter Notebook, and feel free to let me explain to you what's actually going on. But as you can see, we've imported star bunny, again, stored to the image variable, and then we run the canny edge detection algorithm on it. But what is canny? Well, Canny is actually a popular edge detection algorithm that was used in CV and is now available in the OpenCV library. John F. Canny in 1986 developed it, and it has a multi-stage process that detects a wide range of edges and images. There are five key steps in using the Canny algorithm, and if you choose to go into the intermediate and advanced flavors of this class, I'll go farther in detail into this. But those main five steps are noise reduction, gradient calculation, non-max suppression, double thresholding, and finally, edge tracking by hysteresis, which basically helps it track and connect edges. But here you have it. We are now able to actually extract the edge features using this fun and amazing library. So now let's shift over to this next cell here where we are now focusing on something known as key points, which you'll also see in the variable nomenclature. Now, key points are unique regions in an image, like corners of a specific texture. Descriptors usually describe these key points in a way that can be invariant to scale, rotation, and illumination. So we're going to run this as well, and when you see the output, you'll find it pretty interesting because what's going to happen is you'll suddenly see a bunch of these glowing dots. What are those? Well, what we did here, especially when we created orb equals cv2.orb underscore create, is we instantiated an orb object or the oriented fast and rotated brief object. This is used to detect and compute key points and potential descriptors in the image. Parameters, such as the number of features or n features, the pyramid, decimation, the pyramid decimation ratio, score type, and fast threshold can all be adjusted to fine-tune the detection process. And as you can see, there appear to be many key points, not just on the star bunny itself, but also in the background, in features of the galaxy, and even in the cluster of stars that star bunny actually nests on. Overall, ORB, again oriented fast and rotated brief, is a popular choice in computer vision for tasks that require feature matching, such as object detection, panorama stitching, and motion tracking, due to its great balance of performance and computational efficiency. Now that we have key points and descriptors, you can actually also match these between different types of images. This is fundamental for tasks like image stitching or object recognition. So I'm going to scroll down here now, and you'll actually see that what we do is I begin loading another image, which will be that of a cat. The sample JPEG actually comes standard with the CV2 library. And what we're going to do is basically replicate what I just did above with Star Bunny, but with this cat. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use these three key functions of the BF matcher, of detect and compute, and draw matches in order to actually visualize how these all overlap. And you'll see, lo and behold, there are many edges that are drawn, but they don't seem to totally line up. Even more interestingly, you'll actually notice that the dimensionality of the actual star bunny image is far smaller than that of the cat. And you see a lot of collisions on only one section of the cat's face. What could this mean? That's up for us to find out later. But let me unravel the magic behind three key amazing methods here. BF matcher, norm hamming, and draw matches. It's pretty cool. So buckle up for a quick code packed description. So in BF matcher, which stands for brute force matcher, again, right here, you can think of it as sort of like 
playing a memory card game and you're flipping cards to find a matching pair. BF Master does something similar, but actually with the features and images. So what it does is it systematically compares every feature from one image here to every feature in this image. Whether you're building a face recognition app or stitching panoramas, BF Matcher is your go-to, including matching up the Star Bunny cosmic image that I produced with the Gen AI. I think I did this actually with Midjourney almost a year ago, versus a photorealistic image of a cat. It's robust, it's straightforward, and yes, it's definitely brute force. So now let's hop into this second section here where I specify as one of the input parameters to BF Matcher as CV2 norm Hamming. Sounds technical, right? Well, it's actually how I specify the metric for which BF Matcher measures similarity. Now imagine you have two strings of binary code. Norm Hamming simply counts the number of different bits. Lower the count, the more similar they are. And in that way, it's like finding twins in a binary world. It's especially great for binary feature descriptors like Orb because it's a speed demon in matching and making your computer vision project lightning fast. You saw how fast it took for this cell to run. And now finally, the P de resistance, CV2.draw matches. This is visually where the magic happened and where we actually and elegantly displayed all these rainbow lines between the two variables. You see lines drawn between the matching features across the images. It's sort of like drawing constellations in the night sky, but again, with your images. Similar to how we can use this type of algorithm to match historical photos or track objects in a video, Draw Matches brings these results to life, and in this case, was what rendered the alignment between the sample cat and between Star Bunny's raw image. So there you have it. BF Matcher, Norm Hamming, and Draw Matches are three powerful tools in your OpenCV arsenal that can transform how you perceive and interact with the visual world. You'll need to dive in and experiment if you want to unleash the power of computer vision in your projects. And now let's get even more detailed because that's right, you've guessed it, we can also dive into different types of neural networks. And in this case, we'll dive into TensorFlow, a powerful deep learning framework that also offers tools for feature detection, especially when deep learning models are involved. And before we go further, I also want to make sure that you in your terminal have already installed TensorFlow with pip install TensorFlow. Pause the video if you haven't. Otherwise, let's continue. So I've already pre-allocated a lot of these parameters. Uh, one of the key things that I chose to modify, of course, is here, you'll notice that the image that we load into the pre-processing is again our Star Bunny image. I kept the target size aligned to the normal size of Star Bunny, which is a 1024 by 1024 image. And what we're essentially doing is we're loading the VGG16 pre-trained model when it was trained on the ImageNet data set. I actually want to before we run this cell, I also want to clarify with you two specific things. By having weights equal ImageNet pre-trained on ImageNet data, this tells you that we actually are initializing the model with weights that were learned when the model was trained on an ImageNet dataset. In that way, this is actually a form of transfer learning where you can leverage pre-trained models to improve the performance of your model on a possibly related task. What's particularly most important is the section include top equals false. Now, false means that you do not want to include the final fully connected layers, also known as the top layers, that were originally used for classifying ImageNet pay images into 1,000 categories. In other words, you're loading the model without its classification layers. Now, the main reason why you actually want to load the images without its classification layers is because for the purposes of this little lecture and exercise, I'm trying to show you the value of feature extraction. By setting include underscore top equal to false, that tells us that we can now use this model as a feature extractor. Thus, the layers of BGG16 up to the point we cut it off can turn input images into complex representations that can then be used as input for your custom layers tailored to your specific task. So without further ado, I'm going to run this. 
And you'll see the little star tells us that it's thinking. And unfortunately, we ran into an error because, ah, oh, noob error, we forgot NumPy. So let's import NumPy. And now this tells you that we ran exactly one batch and this has successfully executed within two seconds. Pretty impressive. So let's investigate the dimensionality of this. And you'll see we have an output of our features from that block with those features representing 1, 32, 32, 5, 12. What does that mean? Well, the first dimension is the batch size. So a batch size of one means that there was only one image or data point in this batch, which is correct. We only passed star buddy. Now in deep learning, models often process data in batches for efficiency, but here we again just have one single image or data point. The second and third values of 32 represent the spatial dimensions of the tensor. Thus, in the context of image processing with convolutional neural networks like BGG16, this typically refers to the height and the width of the known feature map. Here, this means that each feature map is going to be 32 by 32 pixels. Finally, the fourth value of 512 tells us that in the context of the convolutional neural network, that means that the network extracted literally 512 features and each feature formed a channel in the output tensor. In this case, 512 features were actually extracted. So enough about actually extracting the features. You're probably curious about how to visualize them. This block of code, which you can also pull from the repo or follow along with me if you pause the video and copy it, can actually be what you will utilize to visualize your TensorFlow layer of features. Some key things to note, because this does confuse some people, is that the choice of eight for columns is totally arbitrary, and it can be adjusted based on your preferences and specific requirements on the visualization task. I simply selected this because knowing that my um, dimensions of the tensor were 32 by 32, eight is a multiple of 32, and that sometimes just makes it easier to sort of visualize and space out the number of subplots. You'll actually notice here that the logic of how I begin plotting this is that I'm going to iterate across every one of those features. So I fix to zero because again, there's only one dimension in the tensor. We remain flexible for the dimensionality of the tensor, 32 by 32, but then we iterate across all 512 features. And then we basically visualize what those features look like. Another key thing that you might be noticing is in fig size, I multiplied it by 1.5 for both the number of rows and columns. This is simply set up because that's what I do to ensure that each subplot has enough space to display its content clearly. And that's why the scaling factor is important because once I click on run, we will see 512 hyperparameters of Star Bunny. Aha, voila, and there you have it. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. We'll actually zoom here so you can all sort of take a look as I scroll through, but you'll notice that it does look like a sort of a Rorschach ink blot, but in some of them, you can definitely tell that they're picking up on different parts of Star Bunny, while others are picking up on sort of the cosmic galaxy behind Star Bunny, and still others are picking up on things like Star Bunny's ears. Star Bunny's, I guess, front ear. Here we've even got Star Bunny's paws. And when zoomed out and holistically, it looks particularly fascinating. I think if any of you played with early forms of sort of dreaming AI algorithms back in the early 2020s and late 2010s, you'll remember that some of them seem to pick up on some of these features and generate sort of hallucinations or dreamlike images by inserting new and wondrous combinations of objects where they see these feature maps. And there you have it. As they continue scrolling through, uh, the list just goes on. But this is commonly what you would find in the appendix of a research paper that interrogates underlying imagery. And this is pretty common in sort of an R&D scientist's workflow when he, she, or they are actually looking at, you know, underlying 
image features after passing them through a convolutional model. Well, there you have it, team. This is video 17 out of 20 in our beginner series and introduction to AI. I love this stuff, and by the end of the series, you'll be ready to learn more advanced concepts of AI and machine learning, which will allow you to elevate your career in tech and remain in demand on the job market. Remember, feature detection and matching are foundational in computer vision. And whether you're building augmented reality applications, robots, or any type of AI-driven visual system, mastering these concepts is key. So dive deep, experiment, and keep building. Thanks all.